Probably everybody watching or listening to this right now has played some kind of board game at some point in their lives. Our next guests say those activities are so much more than just fun and games, but rather a window into the human condition. Let's find out what they mean from Jonathan Kay and Joan Moriarty, who've just written a book called Your Move, What Board Games Teach Us About Life. And it's a delight to have you two here with us tonight. You for the first time, and you, I've seen lots of you over the years. <laughs> Let's start this. You've written about a lot of eclectic stuff, and we've had you here on this program numerous times talking about it. This feels a little out of your wheelhouse. So what brought you to this subject? Uh, so I've, I've always been a passionate board gamer. Uh, and it was always something that was kind of like the subcultural thing I did uh, on the side. But I've noticed in recent years that board games are having their moment. Um, you know, much in the way that like, I don't know, 15 years ago, people started writing about video games in a serious way. It, it wasn't just a diversion. It was, in some cases, an, an actual art form, but it was just clearly something that was part of our life. It said a lot about the way we were living. And I felt like there's a lot of strategy books about board games, but no one had actually written a book about the meaning of board games, what they mean for us, how they model our society. Uh, so I wanted to at least co-author uh, a book that I wanted to read, because you know, there was none in the market. Hmm. What brought you to this subject? John originally approached me after my work on the Snakes cast, the Snakes and Lattes podcast, about doing a walrus talk about games and about play. Mm -hmm. And that didn't pan out because they weren't doing one of those events sometime soon. That became an article in Walrus magazine, which became some pitches for more articles, which John said sounded like a book. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Did you have any qualms about co-authoring a book with him? You know, he's a very, he's, he's a kind of a different, anyway, moving on, okay. When you play games, <laughs> You meet a lot of unusual people, and, and you, you're able to get along under difficult it's circumstances. Actually, it's, it's actually one of the best parts of the board game experience, is that once the game starts, doesn't matter what your last name is, uh, doesn't matter your identity, it's, you're all transported into that world, which actually, that's one of the themes of, of, of the essay that uh, Joan wrote for me uh, when I was editing a magazine. Gotcha. This is a digital age, of course, Joan, that we live in right now. So what is the attraction, or why do people even still want to play actual physical games when everything's online. One of the things that you don't get from playing a game online is this. Mm -hmm. You don't get the feeling of being in the same space with someone. You, you can play poker online, sure, but you won't really see the bead of sweat trickling down someone's forehead. You won't get the sense of drama and immersion and the tactile experience of games as well. I mean, people think of games like Monopoly and so on, which at the time, you know, back in 1935, yes, that was pretty advanced manufacturing, but today, the components are such a joy to handle physically, and the art is so rich and sumptuous, the whole experience really gives you something that you can just have, yeah, I can see it in you. You, uh, you dig it, don't it's you? It's hard to find the proper words for yeah. it. You have to play it to get it. The back of a box or a description of a game won't give you a sense of what it feels like to play it. You have to actually do it. I don't want to overgeneralize, John, but are most gamers nerds? So, <laughs> um, we, we can use the N-word, but um, <laughs> I'm not, it's, it's not a word that we, we like others using. Uh, I don't want to make a big deal of it, uh, but so, <laughs> It is true, and I think <clears throat> I acknowledge this in the book, that if you look at the sort of people who play uh, board games, they, they, they weren't the sort of people who back in their high school years were captain of the football team or head of the cheerleading squad. Uh, but times have changed. Like, I think it was the case that, you know, when I went to school, uh, it was stigmatized as just this, this, this nerdy thing. What I think has generally happened is that subcultural life is just cooler now. Uh, you know, if you go to high schools, you know, it's in a lot of places, it's cool to be in the robotics club. It's cool to play video games. It's cool to, to collect certain obscure stuff that you get on eBay. Uh, board gaming is a subculture. And to the extent that all subcultures in this hipsterized society we inhabit is now kind of cool, uh, I think board games fall into that category. There's also just less bullying now. Like, schools are just much more aggressive about being vigilant when, when kids are bullied. So I think one of the, the good knock-on effects is that kids are free to pursue their passion. Well, they, I guess you'd have to be, because let's do one example here. This is a game, I never heard of it, but I read about it in your book. Pax Renaissance. 
Players take on the role of bankers navigating the vicissitudes of war and religious upheaval in 15th and 16th century Europe. I didn't know there was a game there, but apparently there is. Why, why would somebody want to play that? So uh, Pax Renaissance is a fantastic game. It's actually uh, designed by a guy named, named Phil Eklund, who, who uh, actually his... Uh, He's the granddaddy. <laughs> his, uh, his recommendation is here, here on the back. Um, what, one of the great things about that game is it educates you about this incredible period 500 years ago uh, when, when Europe was alive with all kinds of religious wars and uh, you know, the birth of different kinds of commerce. And it is absolutely true that you have to be intellectually curious about that kind of thing in order to enjoy the game. And it's, I, you know, realistically, there's probably only you know, maybe 10 or 20% of people who have the time and the curiosity for that. But for those people, and I guess that's the audience for this book, mm. our argument is that playing an immersive game like that is at least as educational and probably 10 times more fun than seeing a movie or, or just reading a book about it because you actually, you're a protagonist in it. Hmm. You're, you're an actor in this historical drama, or at least a facsimile of it, uh, and you internalize the history in a way that, at least in my case, I don't from reading books. Well, one of the foundations, Joan, of this book is that board games are some kind of window into the human soul. How do you see that? There's a quote that's frequently misattributed to Aristotle. You can learn more about someone in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. Hmm. Conversation is, for many people, a way to avoid revealing who they really are. We curate the things that we say much the way we curate our social media profiles, just revealing what we think is appropriate, what we think is going to get a good response. You sit down and play a game with someone, particularly a game where their choices really matter, chess, for example, and inside of 10 minutes, you will have a window into how they think, how they plan, what they think they can get away with, what they're willing to sacrifice to get something done, how they deal with adversity, how they deal with defeat, how they deal with success. It's much more revealing, it's much more intimidating. Let's do an excerpt from the book and we're gonna find something very revealing here, shall we? If you would, Mr. Director, the graphic, please. The gulf between Ameritrash and Eurogames goes beyond <laughs> the divide between militarism and pacifism. Monopoly, that great bonfire of friendships, is not a war game. Nevertheless, the conflict among players is direct, brutal and zero sum. You bankrupt me or I bankrupt you, which is why so many rounds of Monopoly finish on a note of bitterness. The one game of Monopoly I ever played with my wife ended with her staring me down icily and declaring, without any hint of warmth or irony, I have never seen this side of your personality. John Kay, that's your wife talking about you. What um, is it about Monopoly that brings out the worst in you? Uh, well, I won that game, and one may say that it brought out the worst in her because <laughs> uh, one can detect a note of jealousy. Uh, so, I, you know, maybe she has some work to do. <laughs> uh, I, I think what, what Joan said is, is absolutely right, uh, that in 10 minutes you learn a lot of, about people. And <laughs> this, this story I tell is actually from a period when my wife and I started dating. Um, and, you know, everything was sort of like, oh, after you, oh, no, after you, after you, after you. Uh, and we were, you know, trying to, to curate our personalities. Uh, that act of curation becomes impossible once the dice start rolling and it becomes competitive. Uh, I, I think she had less difficulty curating her personality than I did, but it's absolutely true that if you're both after the same pile of money uh, and there's this, this competition, red in tooth and claw, you exhibit the sort of person you are. Uh, and, you know, and good things come out, maybe, you know, it turns out that uh, you're a very graceful competitor. Uh, and regrettably, in my case, uh, other things came out. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, uh, it, yeah, it, happy ending. You got the ring in the end, yeah, so it yeah, all worked out. Yeah, and well, I won the game. We're, and you won the yeah. game. Do you, tr do you prize that more than the ring on your left hand? Look, I, I, I think <laughs> some of the best parts in the book are about how even the worst games, like games that Joan and I, uh, neither of us like, are the most accurate window into who we are. Because the problem isn't the game, the problem is, is the people. And there's actually, there's actually one, one example I'm hoping Joan can, dis can discuss. Uh, she devoted a whole chapter to it. I'm thinking of Scattergories. You want to tell me about Scattergories? <sighs> Scattergories is a game that I'm not fond of because it has built-in elements within it 
that encourage players to break what I call the magic circle, which what a lot of people call the magic circle, that barrier between the game and real life, in which you must be hurtful in real life in order to succeed within the game. Mm -hmm. And not just in terms of, I'm going to defeat you and bankrupt you in Monopoly, but in terms of, I'm going to use real world leverage on you to get you to vote for my answers as being acceptable, and for theirs as being unacceptable. Hmm. And that's something I take great issue with. Because the scoring system in this game's categories is based on, on polling the room, and it becomes an act of politics. Uh -huh. uh, and as soon as politics are involved, it, it isn't just, well, you know, you helped me out last turn. It's, well, did you do the dishes last week? Or, uh, you know, did you upstage me at my bar mitzvah? <laughs> uh, like, you know, it, it can get pretty dark. <laughs> and, uh, and again, the game is good. It's human beings that are terrible. Uh, so uh, the purpose of the book is to cast light on, uh, on who we are through the medium of games. Hmm. Yeah. Does the smartest player always win? Depends on the game. The smartest player isn't going to have much of an advantage when you're playing snakes and ladders. That's just luck. And of course, there are different kinds of intelligence as well. There is a kind of emotional intelligence, which will serve you well in games of negotiation, like diplomacy or on the boss. There's an analytical intelligence, which will serve you well in abstract strategy games, like chess. And there's a kind of social intelligence that will serve you well in party games and so on. But the most important kind of intelligence, I think, in making the most out of games is allowing yourself the freedom to be playful, yeah. hmm. to play games sincerely attempting to succeed while at the same time being comfortable with the possibility that you might fail. In the hierarchy of games, would Scrabble be considered better than Monopoly because it's really pure skill with Scrabble, whereas Monopoly you've got dice and a lot rests on chance. If what you want is a contest to see who's better at Scrabble's area control mechanics and at dealing with anagrams, then Scrabble is the superior game. If what you want is a game that's largely about chance, but you know has some negotiation elements to it, then the better game is Monopoly. People at Snakes and Lattes, when I'm doing the Game Guru job, they're asking me for recommendations for what board games should be we playing. We should just say, it. Snakes and Lattes is a coffee shop slash restaurant. It's about two blocks away from here, uh -huh. actually. And it's a great place. You go in there, you drink, you eat, and they hand your board game when you walk in. And there's hundreds to choose from. Which can be a problem, because deciding which is the right one when you've got so many options can mm -hmm. be very, very intimidating. And that's where my job comes in. I help recommend games that'll suit people's tastes, and I teach them rules, because most people do not enjoy reading rule books for some mm -hmm. reason. Um, but again, people ask for a game that's fun, or a game that's good. Mm -hmm. No such thing. Every right. game is fun for some people but, but and not I, fun for if others. If I could just add, <clears throat> um, I don't like to talk about intelligence in, in the gaming context mm. because, um, well, I'll give you an example. Sometimes uh, someone will suggest we play Trivial, trivial Pursuit, <laughs> and they'll say to somebody, uh, I'm terrible at Trivial Pursuit, but they'll say to somebody, oh, you're smart, you'll probably win. Uh -huh. But, you know, first of all, it's not true, but also the implication is that if, if you do badly, you're dumb. And you've immediately set this thing where it's like everyone's on edge because, especially if you're playing with people you don't know, you're nervous about playing because they're mm. going to judge you based on the result. And, and Joan can attest that's one of the biggest barriers to teaching people new games mm. is their suspicion that if they do badly, everyone's going to think they're dumb. And it, it's actually a frustration we both have when we teach people new games. I, I should ask you about that because I think Trivial Pursuit's the most successful, most widely played Canadian developed board game ever. You don't write about it. No. I, How well, come? So, Trivial Pursuit, it's true, was a big success. Uh, I had full disclosure, I actually know one of the people who created it, a very nice guy. Um, but one of the reasons I hate it is this reason that at the end of the game, uh, it's kind of like, ha, 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 this isn't really an intelligence test, but uh, yeah. Well, but it kind you, of is. Yeah. You did really crap. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> your pizza has two slices, mine has six. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, it's not something I like. I have other problems with Trivial Pursuit. It's a very interesting subject, and if we write another book on this, I will certainly be wanting to write a chapter about Trivial Pursuit. Um, it's a deterministic game, like Snakes and Ladders. The outcome is determined before you even begin. If you know the answer to a question, you know it. If you don't, you don't. No right. amount of thinking is going to change that. That's a good point. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, I consider it to be a game of pure chance, it's like Snakes test. and Ladders. It, it, mm -hmm. It's like a test under the guise of a party game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to talk uh, appropriateness for a second right. here, and I'm coming back to Secret Hitler now. This is a team-based game, apparently, where players are secretly assigned the role of either 
liberal or fascist during the last months of the Weimar Republic, with the liberals' objective being to assassinate Hitler. I want to know if, in your view, it's, a, it's appropriate to have board games involving real-life, incredibly evil people. You want to go on that, John? I, I think the Jewish men should probably uh, approach this one <laughs> My first. My follow-up was to him, but yeah, okay, go uh, ahead. Uh, okay, um, so it's true that I feel more comfortable talking about it because I, you know, I happen to be Jewish. Um, and, and the one time I played Secret Hitler was, was with mostly other Jews. Um, it's, it's a fantastic game. Uh, you play with as many as uh, 13 people, and it's uh, a game of social psychology where people are trying to guess who is uh, a fascist and who is an anti-fascist. And it duplicates some of the cloak and dagger mechanics, uh, which, uh, of course, historically ended tragically. Um, but the premise of the game is that you want to find Hitler and kill Hitler. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not as if you're role-playing, uh, you know, the monstrous schemes of the Nazis. Uh, the goal of, of the anti-fascist is to kill Hitler. Uh, it was a bold game to make, especially in this age. Uh, but one of the interesting things about these games is, in many cases, not always, some of the most enthusiastic players are from the community that you might think would be most inclined to, to oppose the game. Well, that's the follow-up. How can, if you're Jewish, why would you want to be the fascist? Or why would you want to be the pro-Hitler side? Because it's fun to turn something horrible into a subject for a game. It feels like you're in control of the subject matter. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the same reasons that Jews love watching the producers. Um, there is this, it's subversive, because you're taking something that's offensive and you're turning it into humor, but you're also feeling like you're taking control of it. It's why, it's, look, it's why certain communities will take, will appropriate offensive words and, and put it into their music and their lexicon, because it's like, you know what, you can't hurt me with that word because I'm going to use it, and there's something to that. And it varies from game to game. I mean, consider Freedom the Underground Railroad, a cooperative game about the abolitionist movement in which the players are working to abolish the slave trade in the United States. Um, a lot of care was taken by the creators of that game to approach it with the appropriate reverence and tone. However, the questions were raised about whether or not it's appropriate for white European men to tell that story. Hmm. And I mean, well, the, the, the creators of Secret Hitler are mostly Jewish, right? Yeah. Uh, the but, same people who made Cards Against Humanity. But then you have other examples. Uh, there's a game called Gandhi, which actually just came out from mm -hmm. uh, GMT. And it's a game uh, about decolonizing uh, the Indian subcontinent uh, in, in the, the 1940s. Um, beautiful game uh, about a wonderful subject, highly educational. But if you look at the design team, it's, it's all white dudes. Um, and you know they, they have some consulting help from, from people of South Asian origin. But, uh, the board gaming community is not as fastidious or politically correct as, as, as other communities in that respect because it's a small subculture. And I think people uh, give each other the benefit of the doubt because everyone's so passionate about it. So maybe they're less inclined to stand on some of the identity politics ceremony that exists other places. Joan, you just mentioned another game called Cards Against Humanity. Mm -hmm. Again, I'd not heard of it until reading the book. Oh, lucky Would you. You, <laughs> you want to just, well, that's another controversial one, and I want to get into that right now. Uh, describe the premise of the game, if you would. Ever heard of Apples to Apples? Yes. So, uh, for the benefit of our viewers, each player has seven red apple cards. Each card could be anything. Great Pyramids of Giza, hangnails, socks, whatever. One person draws a green card with an adjective on it, like scary. So, all right? Everybody tries to put in the card they think is the scariest according to the judge. The player's turn it is. We'll mix the cards up, can't tell who can brought which one, and we'll flip them up one at a time. Nobody ever has the card that fits exactly right. So you wind up with weird answers like bunny rabbits or chainsaws or golf ball sized hail, what have you. So Cards Against Humanity took that idea and instead of having green apple cards with an adjective, they'll have a card like, when I'm in prison, I will have blank smuggled in. Or Dick Cheney prefers blank. And for the red apple cards, instead of you know, various different nouns, you would have things like an erection, la an erection lasting longer than five hours or the Jews. So, yeah, it's edgy humor. Is it fun to play this game? Ugh. It's a terrible game. It depends on who you're playing with, and it depends on so many other factors. Personally, I find it uncomfortable. I do not enjoy playing it. Uh, too often, it has a sort of punching down feel. And yet, so many people who play it, even people from marginalized communities, 
feel empowered by it. John, I'm going to do an excerpt from the book and then I'll get you to comment on it. Here's how you two describe it. One of the players of Cards Against Humanity was a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. She had to hold back tears while her friends laughed uproariously at the mention of an act that in real life had wounded her in ways difficult to talk about. She could not quite manage to keep it inside and had to leave the table. Small wonder that some players at that game have no wish to play Cards Against Humanity again. You know, the, does this game cross the line? So, look, I'm supposed to be, you know, in, in, my, in my other professional life where I commentate on politics and stuff, I'm supposed to be the conservative who uh, uh, dismisses the concerns of snowflakes and stuff like that. Uh, but in this context, yeah, it, it, it does sound uncomfortable and I wouldn't want to be at a table like that. Uh, but I'm not even sure you have to get to, uh, to possibilities like that in order to realize that it's not really a, a good game because the object of the game is essentially to shock people with the sort of references that, you know, were popular in middle school. Like, yeah. you know, you're talking about sex and violence or uh, bigotry and stuff like that. And that's funny for about four seconds. And yeah, it feels slightly subversive, but you also feel like you're a child. And when you go into a game store or when you go into a place like Snakes and Lattes and you see a whole wall full of great games, like I ask myself, do I really want to be playing the, you know, this, this juvenile thing. And this is, by the way, one of the tensions in the book where, where Joan and I try and be open-minded about all the games that people like, because you know, some people like some games and others, you know, there's, there's no accounting for tastes. Um, but there, there are some games that, that just rub both of us the wrong way. And well, speaking for myself, I kind of resent these games because I see people playing them and they're like, you know, there's a there's hundred games I could recommend to you that are so much better than that crap you're playing. Uh, <laughs> and, but I don't want to sound judgmental. Well, <laughs> to that end, do you ever, we've got a few minutes left here, I want to touch on two more things. Do you ever have moments, because you've played these games a lot, right? Mm -hmm. This is your living. Not nearly as much as I'd like to, of course. But... Well, do you ever have moments where you ask yourself whether or not you've wasted a fantastic amount of time in your life playing these games? Never. How come? Play is essential. Play is how we learn, it's how we socialize. <sighs> Only so much of your life can be dedicated to the things that you need to do to survive. Some of it has to be dedicated to making that survival mean something. Connecting with people who you care about, connecting with new people, um, in the spirit of play and freedom and just trying stuff and seeing what happens. That has value. Play has been stigmatized as a waste of time, particularly here in North America. It's not as much so in the rest of the world, and this book is very, very American-focused. I would like to go farther afield in future work if I get the chance. But a continent that was founded by Puritans, of course, is going to have a, uh, a, a, a stigma against play. It's going to tell you that you should grow out of games as early as possible, which is why games like Candyland and Snakes and Ladders have so much prominence here, because grown-ups, generally speaking, can't really get much out of them. But when you look at the kinds of things that, I mean, it's true that there's a barrier to entry there. I mean, th there are reasons why Cards Against Humanity are popular, and that's because the games that we love have this barrier to entry. And it's, it can be really, really intimidating. It's hard to get somebody to take that risk. But when they do, when you can convince them to try something that's a little different, usually I do this by ramping people up a little bit at a time, they wind up being far more capable than they thought that they could be. John, I'm going to finish up with you on this. Here's a quote from you in the book. I am not innocent of bad behavior at the game table. I have lost my composure in a game twice in my adult life, and I am still ashamed of what I did years after the fact. Me. Oh, did you write that? What was that all about? All right, I was playing the, a Game of Thrones board game, and this is b before Game of Thrones was a glimmer in HBO's eye. This is based on the books. And this is a game similar to Diplomacy, where players have to gang up on each other to, uh, to take control of territory. It's the War of the Five Kings. And one of my opponents made a move that was not advantageous to himself because it was bad for me. And... For all intents and purposes, I called him stupid. And that was shameful. That was wrong. This, I, is, this is the dark side of gaming that, that viewers are seeing right here. I got like news this, for you. This, yeah. That's not all that dark, <laughs> calling somebody stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, Get over it. If you knew me a little better. <laughs> but here was the other one. Um, a friend of mine was uh, getting us to play a game called Munchkin. 
which is very, very popular and which I absolutely loathe. And I could not conceal my disgust at the table. I was just having such a terrible time of it that she wound up putting the game away. Now, did you end up halfway through? Have you end up friends with both of these people after it was all said and done? They forgave me. They forgave you. But that's because my friends are wonderful people and I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> The people who play games with us, they're the real heroes of this book. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> They'd have yeah. to be. Okay, well, your move. Ah, nice. Nicely played. Thank you. Yeah. I see what you did there. Is that you said? Yeah. <laughs> That's the name of the book. Yeah. Jonathan Kay, Joan Moriarty. Good of both of you to join us here at TVO tonight. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.